I would like to welcome Simon S. K., who is the Dean of the Undergraduate Law Program of the University of London. Now, uh, Simon came to Sri Lanka this morning at 4 30. And then, after a small nap at Shangri La, he decided to come and talk to you. Now, this is not the first time that Simon has actually come to CFTS, but it's the first time he's delivering a lecture from this lecture hall. Most of the time he has been uh, doing lectures at the other even other hall. Uh, now, uh, Simon's first appointment with the University of London was in 2008. That was as the Deputy Director. Subsequently, he became the Director of Laws. And presently, he is the Dean of the Undergraduate Laws Program of the University of London. But uh, his first contact with the University of London was in 1996 as a law student of King's College, University of London. But uh, law is actually Simon's second academic option. His first option, first degree, was in theology. And uh, at uh, King's College, of course, uh, they were very cruelly not giving Simon a first class. <laughs> he came very close to getting a first class, but uh, of course, he was very generous. Last year, at the May, uh, May exams, eight students around the world were given first classes by Simon, and one of them was one of a CFP student. Although he did not get a first class, but he did not deny first classes to other students. Uh, then uh, he also did the LLM, Intercollegiate LLM uh, with the UCL, where his courses were split between the London School of Economics and the UCL. Simon has uh, authored many books, a few books, and one of those books is this book which is available in our library, Studying Law, which most of the students actually, we do our law skills program using that book. And uh, also it is quite interesting to say that he is uh, also an Anglican priest. He serves as honorary assistant priest of the Diocese of Southwark in England. Simon, uh, the students have been very eagerly waiting to listen to your lecture and uh, this morning some of them forgot the lecture hall. <laughs> they were supposed to go to another lecture hall but most of them had assembled here and they were getting prepared for your class of your Can you hear me if I jump into the microphone? Can you hear me all right? Yes? Sure? Okay, then uh, otherwise I will use it. I'm going to have fun. I normally don't stand still, so uh, I will move around, and particularly because this pillar is here, I won't hide behind here. <laughs> I might move from side to side, especially if anyone is noisy, because I am very strict, as you can tell. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about the Ivory Act. I guess that you have looked at it already, is that right? You've looked at it already? How many times? Once, twice, three times? No times. <laughs> so how many times have you looked at it? You haven't. Is that right? Can someone tell me, or is it? Have you been through it with anyone else already? No. no. Good. You can say no. I just need to know because it's, if I know, then I know where I'm coming from. If you have done it lots of times, then we can do something complicated. If you have not done it lots of times, then we better do something simple. Now, I think this week, though I don't know, I wrote it in December, that there is on the VLE a lecture plus about the Ivory Act. I think it just came out this week. And I think there will be a sample question. And in two weeks' time, I will provide the answer to that sample question. So uh, you will see. It's quite useful to look at because in a way, what you often need to know about an examiner is how their mind works. You know, the best thing to know about an examiner is how they think. And it's interesting for me to put that uh, question up because when people answer it, I can see how they are thinking and how it doesn't match how I think. Now, I, maybe I've got it wrong. Maybe. There's a small chance that I have. None of us is perfect not even you. And so we have to think about how might, that might work. So let's have a look at it and think about it. What is ivory? 
Does anyone know? You must know. You've got lots of elephants in Sri Lanka. Well, I've not many. I don't, I've not seen any for a while. I did about 10 years ago go to, on the road to Kandy, I think, to see an elephant orphanage and see them taking a, well, I suppose it was a bath. I don't know. Uh, but uh, what is ivory? Does anyone know? What if I think? What? Tusk, yes. That's true. What else can it be? Do you know? This will surprise me. Surprise me. It can also be the tooth of an elephant, apparently. So it can be the tusk or the tooth of an elephant or lots of other creatures. Uh, a creature called a narwhal, which you've probably never seen. You don't have those in Sri Lanka. They look like a dolphin and they have a big kind of pointed tusk on their head. So, but it looks like a dolphin. Uh, you don't have them here. I think they're found in South America. Uh, you can see those creatures like walruses. They're like seals with tusks. And uh, so this is what it says. Now, the thing is about these things is that, of course, we have ordinary meanings of words. But of course, we're not interested in the ordinary meaning of the word. We're interested in what the act says the thing means. So let's look at how I see the act structured. If you, most of this stuff at the top, you can, you can ignore everything until the number one. So where it says, you know, ivory act, chapter, an act, be it an actor, you can ignore that. These are just standard parts of an act. And uh, you don't need to know, well, you, you can, I can tell you what they are, but they're not very important. The words I react at the top of the page are just the name of the act. That's obvious. This stuff beneath it, where it says 2018 chapter 30, just means that it is the 30th act of parliament in 2018. That's all it means. Then it says, an act to prohibit dealing in ivory and for connected purposes. This is the long title of the act. And the date, can anyone guess what the date is at the end? What do you think it might be? Sorry? Good, yes, it does. It means exactly that. It means the date that the act was passed. So that's the date the act was passed. Now, in, this doesn't mean that every part of the act is in force. But for our purposes, we will pretend that it is. We don't want to complicate it. Then when you see this other thing where it says, be it enacted by the Queen's most excellent majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the Lord spiritual and temporal and commons in this present parliament assembled, and by the authority of the same as follows. Does anyone guess what that means? That's not very really simple English, is it? They're called the enacting words. And all it really says is, be it enacted by the Queen's most excellent majesty. Can you remember from public law what you need to have in order for an act of parliament to, to come into force? What you need? Can you remember? The royal assent. So we start with the royal assent. So this is actually the royal assent be it enacted by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty. When it says, by and with the advice and consent of the Lord spiritual and temporal, which House of Parliament do you think that is? The House of Lords, yes. And the Lord's spiritual are the bishops. And the Lord's temporal, temporal means of time. So they are, they're the other Lords. So it just means it's been, all it's really telling you is, this Act has got the Royal Assent. It's been through the House of Lords, and it's been through the House of Commons, and therefore it's an Act of Parliament. That's all it's really telling you. You don't need to learn anything about it, you just need to know that that's what it's telling you. I'm not going to ask you any questions about that bit. We're having a riot outside. People who can't get into the lecture are protesting. <laughs> So you see then that there are ah, one very important thing you need to learn uh, in order for an act of parliament to, to come into force. What you need, you remember the royal assent. So we start with the royal assent. So this is actually the royal assent. 
be it enacted by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty. When it says, by and with the advice and consent of the Lord Spiritual and Temporal, which House of Parliament do you think that is? The House of Lords, yes. And the Lord Spiritual are the bishops. And the Lord's Temporal, Temporal means of time. So they are, they're the other Lords. So it just means it's been, all it's really telling you is, this Act has got the Royal Assent. It's been through the House of Lords, and it's been through the House of Commons, and therefore it's an Act of Parliament. That's all it's really telling you. You don't need to learn anything about it, you just need to know that that's what it's telling you. I'm not going to ask you any questions about that bit. Are we having a riot outside? People who can't get into the lecture are protesting. <laughs> So you see then that there are ah, one very important thing you need to learn. Uh, let me just find one that I can show you this part. Oh ah, yes, let's look at can you look at page three? Can you? Can you see at the top of that page there is something that begins with the Roman numeral one? This is a Roman number one. An I. Can, sorry, it's not easy to see from that picture. Can you see that one at the top of the page, on page 3, where it says, makes a declaration? Now open the two pages up together, and you will see that if you look on the bottom of page 2, a big number 5 in bold, yes? Which says registration. Now this bit, if you wanted to cite this bit, this one with the I, you would say that this is in section 5, Subsection 1, paragraph D, at point 1. Actually, it's called a subparagraph. So, if you wanted to tell me about this bit in the exam, you would have this S.5, open bracket 1, close bracket, open bracket D, close bracket, open bracket 1, like the little one, close bracket. And the, the thing to remember is, just follow what it looks like here. If it's got a round bracket round it, put a round bracket round it. If it hasn't got one, don't put one. But don't make anything up yourself. This is law and it's not to be lit. I'll write it here so you can just see it as well. This looks like in section 5, um, 1, D, and this is a Roman numeral one, that little I. This is like the number one. Now, this is really important in the exam. Make sure that you cite it exactly. Do not put, it is in one. You know, don't put like, it is... You can't say the answer is to be found in I. But I don't know which I you're talking about. So you've got to identify it. So you've got to think of it hierarchically. And you can see it on the front page if you go. It's easy to see there. You can see you have a section with a big one saying prohibition in ivory. Thankfully, you don't have to speak it when you write it down. You can just write it like, like the S dot thing. But if I were telling you about S dot 51D1, I would have to say at section one, in subsection one, well, there's nothing in subsection one. If we go to subsection two, we can see there's paragraphs A, B, C, D, E. And if there was an I, that would be called a subparagraph. So if I was citing it in court, I would say I'd like to draw the court's attention to section five of this act, at paragraph, uh, sorry, subsection 1 at paragraph D at subsection 1. But thankfully in the exam you write S5 1 D1. 
and you don't have to save. But make sure you do that, because you'll lose tons of marks if you don't. Because if you cite it like this, this shows you don't know what to do. And you know in life, if you are an idiot, do not tell people. Keep it a secret. <laughs> don't, you know. Why should you give your stupidity away? Let them find out themselves later. Try to hide everything like that. If you are a fool, then keep it to yourself. Uh, you know, never give these things away. If you have some doubt, try to skim over it. Don't kind of say, oh, I have no idea. Just sit there and go, hmm. <laughs> Quiet. You know, don't be so. Make sure you cite it very accurately. Okay, so let's have a look at this then. So let's look at section 1.1. One, one. And it says, dealing in ivory is prohibited. Now, in a way, dealing in doesn't have a very obvious, ordinary English meaning. If I talk to a, if I said to you, have you been dealing in, what I would say, number? Have you been dealing in drugs? <laughs> That's about the only phrase I can think of. What does, do you use that phrase here in Sri Lanka? Talk about drug dealers? I hope none of you are, but... Um, but we normally mean somebody who... I think actually we normally mean someone who sells drugs, don't we? But I suppose a dealer, a drug dealer is a kind of middleman. A person who buys the drugs and then sells it to somebody else. But actually, it's not a very common term. If, if I said to my mother, what have you been dealing in? I think she would look at me rather puzzled. She wouldn't really know what I was meaning. So, and she wouldn't think that I thought she was a drug dealer, thank you. <laughs> but, so I think it doesn't make, so we know that this is the prohibition. Now, the prohibition is the conduct that is prohibited, the thing that you cannot do. If we were doing statutory interpretation, we would say this is the mischief that the act is aimed to stop. But you don't have to talk about the mischief rule, or the golden rule, or the literal rule, or purposivism, or anything else when you do this. All you talk about are the words in the act. So don't start whittering on about other things. Because it's really an act, it's really a, a, a task of legal comprehension. What I'm trying to see is, do you understand how the act is built? Do you understand how the bits connect? Now, it says dealing in ivory is prohibited. Now, if, when, I do, when I read this act, well, I read it, and actually this is a very, very heavily amended by me because I'm trying to give it to you to be able to use as a first year piece of work. I don't want you to have the complications of the whole act, it's too much. You are just babies, you know, and you, I don't want you to kind of die of shock yet. And say that for the second year. Codeine, uh, if you have this drug, it has some painkiller things, but it also has coffee in it, uh, caffeine from the same thing. If you buy lots of flu remedies, they have caffeine in them because they have to try and make you feel better when you are feeling bad. It's meant to kind of boost you. So a lot of things are modern. So you are right. If it says dealing in drugs, there are probably millions of drugs. So you need to know which ones it means. So, same here. If it says ivory, we want to know what ivory it is. So look at section seven. So I told you that there are lots of creatures that have ivory, but actually, this act, what kind of ivory is it? From which creature? Okay, from an elephant, that's it. So I might try to catch you out and put some ivory in from another creature. I might say it's ivory and then I might make up something. A creature, you know, a mystical creature. But I probably won't make up a mystical creature. I'll do something worse than that. So, then, it says it's from an elephant. But it says something else in section 7.2. In this section, elephant means an animal of a species that is A, within the family Elephantidae. 
don't know what that means, neither do I actually, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> but actually, you know that in kind of, in the, you have probably seen it, I don't know, in, if you look at the common name for a bird or a common name for a particular animal, you will see that they belong to something called a genus, uh, something to do with its genetics. And, you know, we are all organized, you know, we are in the genus of sapiens, homo sapiens, you know, we come from, that's our, that's our Latin tag. And, you know, if you, I don't know, I don't know much about Sri Lankan birds, I'm plenty of I have seen in Sri Lanka. Um, well, I don't know, if you have a domestic cat, uh, cats come from uh, the uh, uh, genus Felix. That's why often people are called, and there's a cartoon, or there was, called Felix the Cat. This is a play on words, because Felix is the Latin for cat. So it's cat the cat. Uh, but, you know, these are things. So this is all only what it means. So it means it comes from this species. And then it says in 7.2a, extant, on, uh, on the day on which the act is passed. Does anyone know what the word extant means? If you do, I'll give you a first. I'd be surprised if you know what it means. I don't think we. Did you say anything you said? Oh, well, you can have a first. It's all right, in existence. It means something that is existing. So, what it's saying in this bit, I hope we're going to get the first one. I mean, I can't give you one unless you really get it. Uh, it means then, so it's got to be within this species, and it's got to be existing on the day on which the act is past. Now in order to help you with this, I have made up a list on the back page. This is not really in the act, but you'll see on the back page, list of extant elephantidae on 20th of December 2018. I got this from Wikipedia, so it must be right. <laughs> And you can see that I have put all these, I then found out what their uh, Latin name was, and I wrote it all down to make it look impressive. But in the exam, I will not use Latin words, because it's too confusing to me. <laughs> you might get it. So I will use these words that I have put at the side. African bush elephant, African forest elephant, the Asian elephant, the Sri Lankan elephant, the Indian elephant. You can see that the Sri Lankan elephant and the Indian elephant are related. Can you see that? Elephas maximus maximus, that means big, big. <laughs> <laughs> and the Elephas maximus indicus, one that is of the same group as the maximus one, but not quite the maximus one. <laughs> but I won't write those things down. Now what I am likely to do in the exam is make up an elephant. I might put something like, I'm trying to think, what have we got? Warmium. I might put the Malaysian elephant. Or I might put, I don't know, I won't put anything too stupid. I might put something like, you know, and I'll put something that makes a bit of sense. I mean, I won't put the British elephant. <laughs> uh, but I might put somewhere that people might think there was an elephant. Like, come to, I might put, I don't know, the Burmese elephant or something like that. So make sure that you check this thing. So the first thing you've got to do, you've got to remember that this thing is about ivory. And so before you can even think about anything else, you've got to say, is it ivory? And if you're thinking about whether it's ivory, you say, go to section 7, you go down those things. 7-1. Is it from the tooth or tusk of an elephant? First question, yes or no. If it is, is it from one of these elephants on the list that was alive, on the t that still existed on the 20th? If yes, then it might probably ivory. And then we've got to look at what it might be. So let me, let's try an example so we can see uh, how it goes. Um, So let's say that um, uh, Simon goes to Sri Lanka, to Colombo. And what does he do? He buys a 
a table made of, I don't know, uh, metal <laughs> with ivory, uh, what can it have my table, an ivory pattern. And the ivory is from uh, from an elephant. <laughs> okay, let's 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 try that one. Let's try and leave it loose because I might do that too. So I go to Colombo and I buy a table made of metal with an ivory pattern and the ivory is from an elephant. So we're thinking about whether I dealt in ivory. So let's look at seven again. So it means the tusk or tooth of an elephant. Well if I've written ivory then that's all it can be can't be from anything else except a tusk or a tooth of an elephant. It doesn't mean the elephant's head. So it can't be that. Now, so we know that I, that 7 1, I probably got some ivory. But the problem is 7 2, isn't it? Because I haven't told you enough information. Because you don't know whether it's from an elephant that's within this species. What would you do if that happened in the exam, other than panic? <laughs> what would you do? Supposing I don't tell you what it's from, what are you going to do? Say if. Uh, if what? If, if it's from one on the list, yeah. then the answer is this. Yeah. And if it's not from the list, then the answer is that. Correct. That's what you have to do. Sometimes some facts are left vague like that to make you talk about both things. So sometimes you might do that. I probably won't do that because you are just first years and I don't like to be too mean to whoever you are. And in fact, I, uh, I would think that's just a bit too hard for you first. I might have two items in the question, one which would be very easy to deal with and one which would be more difficult to deal with. So I might do that because I want to know how well you know it. So, Ivory is from, let's say, a Sri Lankan elephant, why not? So, a Sri Lankan elephant. And it's from a Sri Lankan elephant tooth. I don't really know what ivory from a tooth looks like, but I've never... I mean, I actually I've got a table with ivory in at home. came actually not from Sri Lanka, came from Borneo, I think during the Second World War when my uncle brought it home in pieces and it's made like an elephant, it's got elephant legs and you have to pin it all together and then I realized it's got ivory in but I have not dealt in it, I have not bought it <laughs> I am not a criminal under the act uh, so. so, okay, so 7-2 then is it within the family Elephantidae 7-2-A and was it extant 72B on the day the act is passed? And the answer is yes, because if we look at the back, we see that there is Elephus Maximus Maximus, the biggest of the lot, the Sri Lankan elephant. So we know that he, he, he's bought a table, brought it. Uh, now, what are we going to have Simon do? Okay, so he brings the table home. An item consisting only of unworked ivory. What's the table? Which is it? A, B, or C? Is it made of ivory? No. It's made of metal, I told you. So it's not 73A. Is it 73B? Yes. It's not 73C, is it? So, if we are thinking about this, when we are analysing the question, we have to write all these sections down. So we know that we've got to do 7, 
one. We know we've got to talk about seven, uh, two A and two B. We know also we've got to then talk about seven, three, and we've got to decide which it is. And we think it's seven, three, sorry, seven, three B. Right? Now, if you're, uh, if you're analyzing this question, I want to see all those sections written down in that answer. I want to see every one of these, section 7 1, 7 1, uh, 7 2 A, 7 2 B, and I want you to choose from 7 3, which it is A, B, or C. There's no way you can answer any question at all in the exam without mentioning all those sections. This, and remember, all the words are in front of you. So the skill here in this preparing for this exam is to make sure you know how this works. So that when you look at a question, you know where you're looking. So that when you go to the exam, it's not the second time you looked at these bits of paper. You know, today we meet and then when the exam comes and you're like, what was he saying? So you need to kind of just make sure you understand. So in my mind, I would go from 1-1 one, one, straight to 7. And I will sort it out whether there's any ideas to talk about. So he brings the table to the UK. So let's go back to one. And see if the wicked Simon has done something that we act prohibits. So the prohibition is on dealing in ivory. And dealing includes buying, selling, or hiring. Has he done any of those things? What do you say? Buy? Correct. Buys. So this is section 1, 2, A. So I want you to point out that he's bought it. Never kind of make your mind up until you skim read through. Has he done anything else there? Offering or a jade? No. Not sold it, not hired it, not kept it for sale yet anyway. Has he exported it from the United Kingdom? No. Has he imported it into the United Kingdom? Yes, because he has brought the table from Sri Lanka to the United Kingdom. But has he done so for sale or for hire? No. So section 12E doesn't apply. But it might, because I might change the facts in a minute. Um, so is Simon guilty then of dealing in ivory? Yes, so far. But how are we going to help him off? We're going to look down a little bit further to section 14, where it says in, set, in subsection 12, so when it says here, in subsection 1, 2, remember it means this one, 1, 2, this bit here, where it's 1 with a round 2. So in 4 it says, in subsection 2, and it means that bit, that bit there, 1, 2, A, B, C, D, E. So it says, in subsection 1, 2, sorry, in subsection 2, a reference to par in paragraph A. So now we're talking about this one. 1, 2, A, buying, selling, or hiring it. A reference in paragraph A to buying ivory does not include buying ivory outside the United Kingdom. So has Simon reached the prohibition? No. Because he bought the ivory outside the United Kingdom. So, section 1, 4, a applies, and Simon is innocent. But we knew that I was innocent anyway. I'm not going to set up a problem to make myself guilty. <laughs> so, so far he can get off. But, if I just add something, and this is why problem questions are strange. You know, people often look at them and don't realize that you only need to change a tiny bit the answer. If I just then add, Simon brings the table to the UK and 
sells it to Thomas, then this disappears. Because then, then what we have is, is section 1, 2, E instead. So then it becomes section 1, 2, E. And that is, Simon has brought it, imported it into the United Kingdom for sale or hire. So can you see, change one little bit, the section changes, the answer changes. But anyway, let's not have him doing that. Let's go back to section 148A. Because we don't want Simon to be guilty of anything. Uh, that's 148A. So let's pretend section 14A applies. And so Simon goes to Plumbo, he buys the table, the firm, he brings it to the UK. What does he do with it? Uh, he uses it in his garden for, uh, to drink tea off in the afternoon. Every afternoon he goes to his garden, he has a cup of Ceylon tea on his Sri Lankan table. Right? But one day his friend Thomas comes to tea and Thomas says, oh, is this a Sri Lankan table? And he says, well, I don't know, I bought it in Sri Lanka, it's Sri Lankan to me. I drink Ceylon tea from it. It must be a Sri Lankan tea table. He said, I thought so. This is very rare. I believe it's worth 20,000 pounds. So Simon thinks, well, I could buy a new car for that. Perhaps I'll sell my table. So he's kept it, let's say, for two years. as a tea table. I don't know what a tea table is, but some rubbish I've made up, which is what you have to do when you write exams. You've got to think of something that sounds vaguely likely. <laughs> so let's go back then. Uh, do you think that 14A still applies, or do you think 12E is the right bit now. So have a look at that. So what I'm asking you is, he brought it into the UK, and first of all we said, in subsection two from 1.4, in paragraph A, it says a reference in paragraph A to buying ivory does not include buying ivory outside the United Kingdom. So he bought it outside the United Kingdom, so he is not committed an offense. But under section 1.2e, it says it's an offence, or dealing in ivory, sorry, I should say. Dealing in ivory includes importing it for sale or hire. Which do you think applies? What do you think the fact is that you've got to think about? If we go back to the first scenario, where he brought it, let's say, yeah, I don't know, let's say I take it home with me now. I buy, I go out to, I don't know, um, to these places called, I've been there so many times, the Paradise Road and all those kind of funny shops that sell Sri Lankan stuff. And what's There's one near here, is it? Paradise Road is the one here. Is it on the corner there? Yes. Uh, but let's say I go to Paradise Road, I buy this table, it's got some ivory, and I take it home and put it in my garden then that's 14A, isn't it? Because I bought it outside and I imported it into the UK under 12E, but I did not import it for sale or hire. Yes? Are you with me? I'm trying not to confuse you. Tell me if you don't get something. And then I wait two years. So did I import it for sale or hire? No, I don't think so. I imported it to put in my garden. That was not the purpose when I imported it, was it? The purpose when I imported it was to put it in my garden. Now, I don't think that there's a gap of, the gap of two years is significant because it means I didn't import it for sale or hire originally. So I didn't commit an offense. 
So, have I got any other way of getting off? Well, turn over the page. There are some exemptions in section two and section three. There are two exemptions. One is this one called items with low ivory content. Another one is about musical instruments. The most common use of ivory uh, in, in musical instruments is in pianos. You know that, uh, does anyone play the piano? They don't want to tell us. No. You know, their keys are called the ivories, aren't they? Because originally they were covered in elephant ivory, the white bits. And uh, so that was very common to cover those white keys on the piano in ivory. The other use of them is typically on things like plectrums. That's the thing that people use it for a guitar. It's often like a triangular piece, you know, they twing away and, uh, when they're playing. Uh, sometimes you'll also see it in violin bows at the end for decoration, like some white pipe. You know, you see those funny, they're horse hairs originally or something, or cat hairs or something. I don't know, whatever it's, is it horse, I think? I don't know, on a violin bow. And then if you look down the bottom, you will see some ivory at the bottom, a round ring of white ivory. Uh, so you can see. So they were used often in musical instruments like that. Sometimes on guitars, where you see, I'm not very good, I don't know what the bits of a guitar are called, but where you see the long bit, you know, where the strings come down, you often see some decoration there, and often ivory was used there. So often like that. Now, that doesn't apply here, does it? Because he hasn't bought a musical instrument. He's bought a table. And so we can only look at the pre-1947, section two. And we see under section two one, an item that has an ivory in it is exempt from the prohibition if the item is pre-1947. Mm. So we need to know when the table was made. Well, let's pretend that it were. Let's say the table was made in on 1st of January 1947. I don't know how we're going to know that, but it has a stamp on the bottom that says date of manufacture, 1st of January 1947. But let's pretend it's made on that day. Uh, it's pre-1947, so we, we've got to think about, we'll, we've got to go, got to work out what that means. And in order to work out whether it's pre-1947, you have to go to another section. You have to go to the end, to section 8. And you'll see that 8.1 says an item of, uh, that is made of ivory is pre-1947 or pre-1975 if, and then turn over. And you'll see in section 8.2 that a pre-1947 item, what's the date? Not the 1st of January, but 3rd of March. So this is a cunning trick I could play on you. I put in, it was made on the 20th of February 1947. And most people will go, ah, it was not pre-1947, which is why I'm going to do it. Well, I'm not going to do it. Uh, but I might do it to see if you can connect it with section eight. So it's pre-1947. So we need to mention then section eight to A there. I'm telling that. So we know it's a pre-1947 item. Let's go now back to section two. This is why statutes are hard, because you have to keep going here, then there, then there, then here. But it's such fun, isn't it? You're enjoying it, you see? It's like playing tennis. Ping, ping, ping. No, you'd rather be playing tennis. I'm not walking about so much, because it's too hot down that side of the room. <laughs> I'm actually permanently too hot in South Africa because, of course, I'm made for polar weather, not for this kind of... What is the temperature today, I guess? In the, is it ever less than 30 degrees in Sri Lanka? The times when, the middle of the night, 
<laughs> December. How long will it go? Twenty? Twenty-four. That is like the height of summer for us. That is like the hottest day. When I got off the plane, even this morning at 4 a.m. from Pakistan, I'm already sweating. I'm like, oh my God. I've come into a greenhouse. So let's see. Okay, so let's go back to section two. So we know that it also complies then. Now we know here, we know it's section two. One, I think, uh, one A, and we know that because we look at section eight to A, and then we have to ask the second question: Is the ivory in the item integral to it? Do you know what this means? Integral. It means like incorporated, part of it. Like, for example, ah oh yes, well this is museum. This camera, you know, on my phone, on my, uh, is integral to the phone, isn't it? And I can't pull the camera out without breaking the phone, because I don't know how to. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I don't know, this, this switch is integral to the microphone. You, if I pull this out, it will, it's not much use as a microphone. So do you get it? Uh, but this, this is not integral. This bit of this is not integral. If I can pull this off and buy a new one of those and plug it into this and the thing still works. So this is not integral. This is probably going to be the hardest bit of the question in terms of, uh, of working out whether something is integral to something. If you get a question on an item with ivory in it because you'll see that under section 2.2 two, there's another definition so if you have to look at section 2.1b you also have to look at section 2.2 two, which says that for the purposes of section subsection 1b ivory is integral if it could not be removed from the item without difficulty or without damaging it So I think you see what I mean with those examples. But of course, none of these are ivory. Let's imagine that this beautiful lectern from CFPS Law School here, can you, you all know what it looks like, you? You can see it or not see it. Let's imagine that the words law school are made of ivory. And instead of having a piece of very expensive perspex, screwed onto it here. Their letters law school are carved in the wood and inset into the wood in ivory are the words law school. So you know the letters are made like that. Does that make it integral to the to the lecture do you think? You're not very good are you? <laughs> Maybe you're just shy. I'm not used to participating. It's quite fun. It's a very bizarre part of my job, you know, that I go from one place to another. In Pakistan, you won't be able to stop everyone speaking. Here, you can't make anyone speak. <laughs> so it would, this, is, this example, it would be integral because if I carved into the, I can't carve, but if I could carve into this wood and I could put those letters in, how would those letters go in? I mean, you are Sri Lankans, you must have seen some items with ivory in it, have you? I mean, there must be some things with patterns. Like, uh, I don't think I've got a picture of my table. Let me see if I have, and I can show you what it looks like. I can see if I can explain it better. If I did take a picture of it. Ah, yes, here's my table. Can you see my table? Right. Show you. So here's my ivory table. Yes. Can you see it back? And then here's what it looks like. Here's its elephant legs. 
Okay? Now you can see on its elephant legs, it has eyes in the elephant's eyes, which are made of ivory. Likewise, I took this picture actually for the lecture. <laughs> you can see on the top, for some reason, it's got an elephant and some other elephants carved into it. And it's also got, I think, a camel. <laughs> but it's also got some flowers and some leaves. Now, it's obvious by looking at, unfortunately I can't put a picture on the exam paper. Uh, but can you see how that is integral to it? And you can see how to do that, presumably, you carve it, and then you must, I guess, glue it in or something like that. You must get that thing. Now, if I say, if, if someone says to me, take the ivory out of that table, then the table is ruined, isn't it? It's not really any use to me anymore. I can't sell it for 20,000 pounds. I can't sell it for 20,000 pounds anyway. Um, but, but let's imagine I could. So, I think that that would would be integral. Now, if I put that in the exam, I've got to try and explain that in words. <laughs> what words might I use, do you think? It says integral. What would you call that? Do you have a term for it? Like, if you see, if you saw something with ivory set in it like that, what would you call it? Do you have, like, furniture, where you see patterns of other things in it? Do you have any word you would use? Well, we would say it might be inlaid or inset. Inlaid, I think, would be the most common word we would use. So you need to look out for these kind of words. You need to kind of think about, if I say something is inlaid, or inset, or integral to it, or incorporated into it, then I'm giving you a clue that I'm trying to say, you know, I probably won't use integral, because it's in the act. I'll probably use another word similar. Um, I can't think what else you would say inlaid, I think, is the most common. Embedded. Embedded, yes, we could say that, yeah. Sorry, what else? Engraved. Engraved. I don't think we would, yes. I, engraved, you would normally say if, like, you had a plaque where you had, like, you know, where the letters were engraved. But in a way, the engraving is like, uh, to engrave is to, is to cut the letter out. But then if you infill it, that's not the engraving, you fill the engraving in. Now you might think this is, very, this is just really to show you how difficult it is to interpret statutory words. It's not very really, easy, even this is a very simple act, but actually it's quite hard to sometimes know what the meaning is. So, this one doesn't have, well, the problem with this one is not very clear, is it? It just says with an ivory pattern. And actually making the table of metal is a bit crazy on my part because how can you fix ivory into metal? I don't know. So let's change the facts. <laughs> so let's have it made of teak. Teak wood, which is illegal in the UK. Anyway, never mind. You don't need to know. So let's have it made of teak. Teak wood. Because that is what my table is made of, teak wood. So I have two illegal items. I have a table made of teak wood with ivory in it. So I can't sell it, but I can keep it in my house. So what do we want to know about the ivory pattern? If we have it made of wood and it's got an ivory pattern, how would we, if I don't tell you anything else, then you will have to decide whether it's integral, or whether it's incorporated, or whatever. Now, probably I'll write something like, I don't know, uh, with a car and, uh, uh, an intricately, sorry, this is a bit messy, carved ivory elephant pattern. So I would say it's an, an intricately carved ivory elephant pattern. So I'm trying to give you the idea about my table in a way. Because of course I'm obsessed about my table. Um, 
these are kind of ways in which I'm trying to suggest it's inlaid. But I want you to say, if I give you this kind of thing, I want you to say, on the facts, it sounds like it is integral. I want you to make a decision. If you see things like this, you have to look to the facts to try and see what it might be. So these are clues. So if it says an intricately carved ivory elephant pattern, you have to imagine what that might look like. If, it's, if, the, if there's ivory in the table and it's an intricately carved pattern, I suppose I could put an intricately carved pattern inlaid with elephant ivory. Then I've really given you a lot of clues. So let's say that. It's getting very messy now. Intricately carved pattern inlaid with ivory. So let's say it's like that. Is it integral or not? Yes, no? Oh my. You can't make your mind up about this. I've even drawn an elephant for you on the board. <laughs> okay, it's not an elephant. Of course, yes, it's in late, so I want you to say that. Okay, then we have to look up 21C. The volume of the ivory in the item is less than 10% of the volume of the material of which the item is made. Can anyone tell me what that means? No? I'm disappointed. You're not going to tell me anything all afternoon. I want someone to tell me something. Just anything. No, it's all right. Well, it just means like, how much, if you look again, if you look at this lectern, how much of this lectern is made of plastic, you think, assuming that perspex is plastic? Here's the lectern. Let's assume it's made of wood. It might be MDF or some cheap rubbish, but let's assume it's uh, wood. Let's assume it's wood. It isn't actually. It looks like a bit of MDF there. But anyway, uh, wood, let's pretend it's wood and perspex. How much is it this perspex account for? 10%? 5%? Which one? How much do you think? 10%? 5%? If I told you it was 50%, would you agree with me? No. no. Good. So you have got some judgment. <laughs> Not much, but a little. Yes, so it's probably, I think probably less than 10% actually. I think probably significantly less. I would be surprised if it even amounts to 2%. Because there's only one bit of this, and this is about the same length, and this is definitely the same length, and that's about the same length. So it's only 25% of this, and this is even, yes, way less. But anyway, I'm not going to ask you that in the exam. I shall tell you how much it, what percentage is. And of course, I should probably write 9% or 11% or something like this, just because some students will go, oh, it's just. It's not 10%, but it's near. And they'll be like, near? Which way? 1% too much, 1% too little. Actually, it doesn't matter. It's either 10%, if it's above 10%, even if it's 10.1%, it's too much. So, let's say then that, that, so now we make it, by the table, it's made of teak wood with an intricately carved elephant pattern inlaid with ivory, uh, which accounts for 9.9% of the volume of the table, because section 61A is the right one. Uh, 61A would be the one because I've breached it. Have I got any defences? Section 62. Only if the person knows or suspects or ought to know or suspect that the item is made of ivory. Well, I know it's made of ivory because I've, I, I've told you all these things. 
So what's my, what am I going to say? I thought it was made of plastic. Uh, what do you think that section might be getting at? Any clues? So section 6.2, a person commits an offence under this section in relation to an item only if the person knows or suspects or ought to know or suspect that the item is ivory or made of ivory, as the case may be, has ivory in it. What's it doing, do you think? You've done some criminal law, haven't you? Yes? Can you remember any? No. Uh, well, supposing you went to, supposing I bought this table in Sri Lanka, and I bought it and it had a label on, and it said, uh, teak table with, with, uh, with resin, uh, with resin, white resin pattern, right? And then I might be able to say, well, I didn't know it was ivory, because when I bought it, it says white resin pattern. Do you think that would help me or not? Are you on my side or are you prosecuting me or are you defending? What do you think? This is what you have to ask. Who, who am I? What is my expertise? What expertise do I have? Well, of course, not really, but let's imagine I have some. What do I know about? Uh, law maybe. Yes, I know about law. I know about theology. I know about education. I know about philosophy. I know about sociology. And that's all I know. <laughs> am I an expert in elephant tusks? No, I am not. I have never seen a real elephant tusk except on my table. <laughs> I've never been near an elephant and stroked his tusk. I don't know if you gave me a piece of animal bone or a piece of elephant tusk or a piece of fake kind of stuff made of white. Can I tell the difference? No. I am a lay person in that sense, aren't I? I have no expertise. So, if you look at section 6.2, it says you commit an offence only if the person knows or suspects or ought to know or suspect. So what you're looking for then, you're going to have to be looking at the facts to see if it would be reasonable for that person to know. So I'm just a tourist. I go to a shop. I'm on holiday. I buy a table. It says wood and white resin. The price is £50. Do you think that, or what, I don't know what that is in the piece. I suppose £50 is a lot in the piece. Um, it's not really. Uh, about more than 200 to the pound now, isn't it? So 10 pounds is 2,300, so 10,000. Say it's 15,000 rupees. If I buy a table that says wood and resin, do you think that's okay, that price? Or do you think I'm being ripped off? They're just seeing me and saying, white fool on holiday. <laughs> Charge, them double. Charge them the white price. Well, in, in UK money, like this chair would probably cost 50 pounds. Maybe even more. Oh, yes. Yes, what yes. Even a newspaper costs two pounds. So like a newspaper costs about 500 rupees. So you have to see that this is why it's sometimes difficult for me to translate the thing. So yes, a newspaper will cost about yeah, 500 rupees. This pen, if you bought it in the shop, would cost about five pounds, so like 1,000 rupees, more. So you can see what I, so to me, like if I can buy a table for 50 pounds, this is quite cheap to me, if in that sense. This is why it's really hard to make questions for students across different cultures, because it's true, you can go to stuff like, oddly enough, I bought a book in Pakistan last week. It is the same book that you can buy in the UK. 
In the UK, it costs 38 pounds, this book. Pakistan, you know how much it costs? Four pounds. <laughs> it's almost like 90% cheaper. It is exactly the same book. It's printed in India. You buy it in Pakistan for four pounds. Printed in India, in the UK, you have to pay 38 pounds. So it's quite a big difference sometimes, those things. So that would be significant in a sense, but I probably wouldn't attach much to it because I know, because of my moving around in the world, that giving a price to something doesn't always make sense because you might think, you know, 50 pounds is a relatively high sum of money, but for me it would be nothing. It would not, you know, I could buy, I couldn't buy a pair of shoes for 50 pounds. Uh, so, you know, like, you can see the difference. Uh, so you've got to kind of sometimes work that out. So the price would be something you take into account. So you might say, oh, it's relatively cheap, and they said it's made of resin, so I think I would have a defense. But if Simon was an antiques dealer who specialized in elephant memorabilia, then he can't rely on this. Because he can't say, oh, I didn't know it was from an elephant. They're going to be like, well, don't people ask you if things are made from elephants? So that wouldn't work. So that's what you're looking out for here. You're looking out for something there. Then there's another defense in section three, section, sorry, subsection three, six three. It is a defense for a person targeting an offense under this section to prove that the person took all reasonable precautions and exists and exercised all due diligence to avoid committing the offense. So a fact that might give that away is you might say, oh, Simon asked the man, are you sure this is made of resin and not elephant tusk? And they said, oh yes, sir. <laughs> now that might be enough for, uh, you know, but the problem is if you said that, then you are showing that maybe you have some doubt. That's a kind of comment that can go both ways. Uh, you Have you done this criminal case? Uh, I don't think you do it now, actually. The last case that we had, a public hanging in the UK, I think in the 19, before I was born, in the 1960s, um, turns on the facts of a man with a gun, and the accomplice says to the guy, let him have it. So, if, we're, if I'm in a room, and I'm shooting at this girl, you're pointing, you're the police woman, you don't look much like a police woman, you're smiling too much. <laughs> take out your trunch and beat me and that kind of thing. But say, you know, I'm here pointing at you and she says, let her have it. What does it mean? Shoot her? Or give her the gun? But you know, <laughs> what do you think the jury decided? Yes, correct. <laughs> yes, he, they, the jury decided that let her have it, or let him have it meant shooting, and so uh, hanging. <laughs> That's our last public hanging on those words. But you can see that those words are susceptible to two meanings, aren't they? Give her the gun, or shoot her. <laughs> they could mean neither, but you can only tell in the context exactly what they mean. And it's the same with these things. You have to look to the context. You have to look at who is this person? Would they know? Should they know? What kind of questions they did? Like, let me give you another example. Supposing I went to a shop, or supposing I go to Paradise Row, and I go there, and there I, I, I'm trying to remember which one that is. I think that's called an outside way. I'm sure you people don't never go in these tourist shops. <laughs> uh, but uh, you go there, and I went there, and it says, Ivory Corner. You know, there's a sign saying, Ivory corner, and it says, you know, I look there and there's like a white carved elephant made of ivory, and there's, I don't know, a candlestick with an ivory pattern on it, uh, you know, coming down it. There's some other goods that are made of bits of ivory or and wood and whatever. Could I then say that I didn't know or ought not to have known? No, because the sign says ivory corner. What do you think it is? You ought to know or reasonably know. So something like that could also be a giveaway. 
Uh, so that's what you need to look out for there. Let me have a look. So the only thing we haven't covered is musical instruments or and museums. None of this is very complicated. Uh, let me get rid of this bit. What time does this class finish, by the way? You don't know? Four. Four. What, what did you say? What time? When would you like it to finish? Oh, really? Are you sure? Final answer? <laughs> well, normally it goes two to four. Yeah, I don't want the weekend batch, so I don't know. Oh, oh you yeah. The weekend batch. Now you the part-time batch. Because that's for the ones who are not so young. <laughs> Let him have it. <laughs> I'm very bad as you can see. <laughs> My mother told me that boys, they never grow up. They always <laughs> behave like boys. <laughs> That's why they have to have women to look after them the whole life. <laughs> so I'm still as, even though I'm not so young now, I'm still as naughty as I was when I was five years old. I can resist anything except mischief. <laughs> so we can see. Okay, let me just tell you about section three. It's similar. Let's look at them together. It really works in the same way. If you look at section two, you'll see that, like my example of a table, the pre-1947 item has to be under 21A pre-1947. You'll see if you look at 31A, the musical instrument has to be pre-1975. So 1A of both parts is the same, just a different date. So if it's a musical instrument, you're looking at 75. If it's a, another uh, artifact, item, or whatever, you're looking at 47. So 21A and 31A mirror one another. 21B is not mirrored in part, in, in section three, is not. So it doesn't have to be integral. So then what happens is 21C is mirrored in 31B. So the integral bit is peculiar to section two, but 21B uh, doesn't appear. So 21C, the volume is 10%, 31B, the volume is 20%. So it's still the same kind of thing, just the things change. So the date's different, the volume's different. 21D mirrors 31C, has to be registered under section five. So you're going through the same steps. So the only difference is that it, uh, it doesn't have to be integral. Then there's a slight difference, and that is that there's a strange little bit in section 3 to A. And I'm not capable of thinking uh, of an example of this. I can't really work out what to say. It says, does not include anything that although capable of being played as a musical instrument was not made primarily for that purpose. I don't really know, I can't think of anything like that. I mean, so it, it kind of means that something it could be played as an instrument, but it wasn't. So something like decorative, but I don't know what you have that's decorative that you don't play. So, I, so this gives you a clue that I won't be saying this in the exam because I can't think of anything. If anyone can think of anything, they can tell me, but secretly. Uh, because I, I, I find that difficult to understand. I mean, I know what it means, but I've never seen a musical instrument that was made for some purpose other than playing but wasn't played. It's like a decorative piano, <laughs> you know, like, but how do you make a piano? That's what, I don't know how to say it, so it confuses me. Uh, notice two, uh, three, two B. I mentioned this to you before. Includes a bow, like a violin bow or a cello bow or whatever you else you play, an oboe, uh, a plectrum, which I explained to you. This thing for plucking things. 
and anything else that's made for playing a musical instrument. Uh, maybe I've made up something, I don't know, but I don't think so. So you can see two and three mirror one another. Section four is about qualifying museums. I've reduced this section from the original massively because it's very complicated. But what it's really saying is that if you are something called a qualifying museum, you can buy and sell ivory between one another. So qualifying museums are exempt. And I've said that the, under section 4.3, a museum is a qualifying museum if it's a member of the International Council of Museums. Uh, so you have, so it, the trick there might be, there might be a sale between the Museum A and Museum B, but one of them might not be a member of the International Council of Museums, and therefore it won't be exempt. So this is what you're looking out for. Under Section 4.2, notice that it's got to be owned by a qualified museum, before it's sold to another qualified museum, or if it's owned by a private individual. So to think about that example that I gave you about my table, if I registered my table under section five, I could sell it to a qualified museum. Because they can buy something on, that's registered, but if it can't be registered, let's say for example, I don't know, oh yes, let's say uh, that you have a, a a statue of an elephant carved of ivory. These are quite common, actually. I have one of those as well, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's very small. Um, and it's got a broken tusk. Poor thing. Yes. Um, so I've got this little thing. Now, I can't sell that because I can't register that. That's not allowed because it's not under Section 2, it's not under Section 3. But I could give it to a qualified museum. And that, I think, is the whole lot. Oh, one final bit to point out to you, sorry. That's when we thought it was all over. Uh, one final bit. Just notice that, oh, right on the back page, under section 8, section 81A, another trick that could come into it, I'm trying to point out how you think, when you try to write these things, you've got to try and think about how to write a question and make it sound slightly different. But another trick I could play is that, uh, not that I'm trying to trick you, I want you to pass the exam, really. Uh, no ivory was added to the item on or after the relevant date. Now, what could happen here is, let's go back to my table. So I've got this table, I brought it in, I bought it in Sri Lanka, it's got an intricate carved pattern in it of elephants, I think, and inlaid is ivory, and it's from a Sri Lankan elephant, and I took it home, and I kept it in my house, but then I decided to sell it, but I didn't register it. Now, it complied with all the rules, but I could say, but the table was damaged in a fire, and then I had it restored and I have to have some more ivory put in. Then I might change the name of the elephant whose ivory it came from. And then you'd have to think about this bit. No ivory was added to the item after the relevant date. Now if I said that, that it had been in a fire or whatever, and then it was restored, then you'd have to look at section 8, 1A and B. If it was restored, then you'd have to ask if the ivory used in the restoration came from ivory that was taken from an elephant before 1st of January 1975. So you'd have to look at that. And that it was only added for the purpose of restoring it. So that could be another little bit that comes up. Now, I've put a, the question I've put on the uh, VLE is not quite like this question, it's slightly different. And I uh, looked a little bit more at uh, dealing it on that one. So it gives you some more ideas. Uh, interestingly, some student, a couple of students have put, posted an answer. And it's interesting that the second one, actually it's about buying a key ring, I think, that example, in China. Well, of course, no one will be going there at the moment. Uh, <laughs> 
then they want coronavirus. Uh, so nobody will be getting any of that. Um, but I wrote the example before we knew about this, so I, I wasn't picking on them. Uh, so look at that one, because it's just got a bit more discussion of this bit. But I think you shouldn't find this too difficult. It's not a hard, it's not the hardest I've ever said. It's not the easiest either, but it's not the hardest. And it's, it's fairly straightforward in terms of that. Uh, so I think that's enough to talk about, because I'm bored now. <laughs> Are you bored from me too? Okay. Uh, do you want to ask me any questions? No, good. Thank you. <laughs> then I'll take my hand. Uh, hope that you enjoy reading the IP app. I'm sure you have no questions. But you go ahead. Okay. Um, Yes. I suppose it must be possible that some some things are made simply for decoration, and so they are trying to exclude them. But I can't think of what. I mean, I don't know what. Sometimes it's quite hard to think of what they do. They're probably copying something or something else. Did you want to ask a question about that? Go ahead. Someone is like calculating the percentages like of the volume. Of uh, I can't hear. What if someone? What if someone buys like hybrid products, like not just one, like many? Yes. Calculating the volume. Ah uh, no, the volume is of that item of that individual item. So if I bought ten of these CFPS lecture lectures with you know law school in ivory, it just means that bit. Just every separate item. So the, that single item. So not the ivory calculated as you know parts of things. Is that what you mean? Then, uh, no. Like, yeah, like, but, and then uh, could he like you know uh, register it and then sell it? Uh, like could he like register it and then sell it? Like, if you can register it, you can sell it. So if it's got ivory less than 10% and it's pre-1947, you can register it and you can sell it. If it's a musical instrument pre-1975 with less than 20% volume, you can register and sell it. But if it's a table with 11%, you can't register it, you can't sell it. But you could give it away. <laughs> So, you know, the, you know, but you might not want to give it away. <laughs> and likewise, you know, same with the musical instrument. If it's pre-1975, less than 20%, register, sell. But 21% can't register it, can't sell it. So, it's, that's, that's how it works. I mean, basically, the act is to stop, it, it, it mimics or copies uh, an act made by, I think, the World Wildlife fund or something, which many countries have adopted to stop the trade in ivory. That's really what it's trying to do. So, and that's why, but, because there are a lot of historic items made of ivory, I mean, a lot of things are made of ivory. Uh, I've actually got, I'm, I don't, I can't believe how many things I've got of ivory. I've got a letter opener which belonged to my grandfather, which has a handle made of ivory, you know, like, it's a kind of silver letter opener. Well, I, I've never used it, <laughs> but it's got the handle made of ivory. I would reckon that's about 50%, you know, looking at the thing. So I can't do anything with it except keep it in case a burglar comes. <laughs> I was just opening my letter, my lord, when he came in and I stabbed him. <laughs> it was sheer So, you know, I, I, that's a, those things you can't. So that's how you do it. Anything further? No, good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.